Good morning and welcome to the last session of our amazing Mediterranean Model Forum. I'm very honored and it's a big pleasure for me to introduce you Professor Gra Graham Murray. You met him yesterday in the afternoon, but today he will give us uh, an amazing lecture. He's an associate professor at the University of Cambridge. So thank you very much for your talk. Have a, a nice day. Thank you very much. It's really nice to be here. Uh, so there's a change in the title of my talk. So I'm sorry if you wanted to hear about Mendelian randomization. I already talked about it yesterday, so I thought it would be boring for those of you who came yesterday to, <laughs> to hear about it today. But I'm really happy to talk about it at the break. I'm very passionate, enthusiastic about it, but I'm not going to talk about that now. I'm going to talk about um, this idea of the brain as a predictive machine and how if we think about that, we can help understand some of uh, sort of normal psycholo some psychology in health and also how uh, psychology might be affected in, in, in psychosis and how some of the symptoms of psychosis could arise and how we could understand them. So I'm going to talk about uh, predictive coding, predictive processing. I'll explain what that is in health, how that is affected in psychosis, and then hopefully cover learning, prediction error, belief formation, perception, and psychosis. We started a little bit behind the scheduled time, so I don't know if I fit all it in, but I'll speed up towards the end if I, if I need to. So please. Yeah, time. Oh, we're good. OK. Oh, we're perfect. Okay, we're great, excuse me. We're perfectly on time, but maybe I've crammed too many slides in. So we'll see. Let's go with health. Right, so what do we see on the screen? Most people see, how many triangles are there? Two triangles? Well, most people see, they see uh, an upside down white triangle with white edges and a pointing upwards black, a white triangle with black edges. That's what we see. But if you look really closely here, there's nothing here. There's, there's no edge here. But you think there's an edge because you see the angle here in this. Some people call these a Pac-Man or a cake with a slice of cake cut, cut out. And this creates the illusion that there is a contour here. But there is, there's no contour there. If you looked at the pixels on the screen, but we think there is because we expect to see one. So this is the, the famous Kanitsa, excuse my pronunciation, triangles. And we are so, our brains are so expecting to see triangles that we see these edges, these illusory edges or contours. Uh, and it's a very ingrained um, effect, it's very hard, it's impossible to not see it really, or very difficult. So this one works best if you're a native English speaker, so I don't know how, I'd be interested to know how well it works for people who, or if you, if you don't know the nursery rhyme, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail, fetch a pail of water. Um, so that's a nursery rhyme that a lot of British children are, are taught. And if we see this, we, we read the sentence, Jack and Jill went up the hill. But if you read this sentence, we read it as the last event was cancelled. But if you then look closely at the shapes on the screen here and the shape on the screen here, they're identical. But when you know the meaning of a sentence, which you pick up almost instantly, it changes your perception of letters, shapes, words, and this is so we minimize the surprise. It would be very surprising to say, Jack and Jill event up the hill, the last went was cancelled. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense, it, it strikes one as odd. Unconsciously, our brain doesn't, doesn't want that surprise, so we, it, it makes the interpretation that minimizes the surprise. I'll talk more about prediction error later. Um, but if we, 
one implication of this is that perceptions and beliefs are not as distinct as one might think. You think there's perceptions and there's beliefs. But um, as we saw with the triangle, we make a perception and then we form a belief about the... We have a perception and a belief almost simultaneously about what's on the screen. And then here again, it starts to break down this distinction of things we might think are totally distinct, but perhaps they're not totally distinct. Um, so how does our brain do all this prediction so that we're, the predictions and our expectations are shaping our sensory experience? Um, the idea of the predictive coding understanding of the brain and mind is that the mind and the brain are constantly updating uh, its understanding of the world or the sensory input that's coming in through the senses and our previous expectations, also termed prior beliefs, are shaping the sensory data that's coming in from our senses and that's updated through these surprise or prediction error signals. And then perception is somehow an interplay between our expectations and the sensory input. How does this happen in the brain? So this is the visual cortex, V1. Remember back to medical school um, uh, in uh, anatomy where the most basic visual processing occurs and then this higher order visual regions that deal with more complex processing. So the more complex higher order regions are sending predictive information along the deep layers of the cortex. Again, back to neuroanatomy cortex, six layers. I ignored that for many years until I then learned that it's important for how the flow of predictive and sensory information grow. This is maybe one reason, one reason why we have different layers of the cortex. So the predictive information is going along, uh, passing either along the deep layers or sometimes from the deep layer to the most superficial layer. What about the sensory information? That's coming along more than, more than middle layers. So right, the sensory information from V1 going up to V2 and so forth and propagating throughout the brain. Sensory information going along more the middle layers and the predictive information along the deep or from the deep right to the most superficial. And then somehow or other there's some integration going on uh, where the prediction error signals are making an integration and so forth. So this is a basic understanding. Uh, so we have our Kanitsa triangle again, and we can do some brain imaging uh, of showing people the Kanitsa triangle and see what happens in the brain when you do this. So if you have the, um, if you have the Pac-Men or cheeses organized in this way, then you have uh, the illusion of a contour here. Looks like a triangle. If you rotate them, then there's no imaginary or illusory contour. So in brain activation studies, we look at what is the brain activation in this condition minus this uh, condition. And if you have a very strong magnet, you can uh, start to look within these different layers of the cortex. It's very difficult because the cortex is obviously very thin, got six layers. <laughs> Uh, how can we get down to the tiny little millimeters across the, uh, the different layers? It, it's not easy, but it's possible to do, especially with a strong magnet. And so this is a study by Peter Koch uh, and, and colleagues, and they didn't manage to look at all six layers, but they looked at the deep, the middle, and the superficial. Here's when you're looking at the illusory triangle, no difference in the superficial and the middle, and then, but in these deep layers where we've got the predictive information, there's some difference in some healthy volunteers in the brain activation across the deep layers when you see this illusory triangle, so a uh, contour. So there's some evidence in humans uh, that this is really what, what's going on. Some evidence. MRI, excuse me, yeah. If you put people in a... MRI scanner, the stronger the magnet, the more, uh, the better, the, you can get a better close-up. It's like having a strong lens in your camera, you can get a nice close-up, have a strong magnet, you can really zoom in and get detail from these tiny different cortical 
layers. If you have a, a standard hospital scanner, 1.5 Tesla, you really need seven Tesla scanner uh, to be getting into these different cortical layers, and now there are some even stronger uh, ones available. But uh, you have to, the p participants have to lie very, very still. Uh, because if you move a little one millimeter, then what you thought was layer six becomes layer five. Uh, so it, that's not good. <laughs> um, so, right. So we have, we've thought about these illusions. What about, one thing is illusions. What about hallucinations? So a hallucination is something we only see in severe mental illness, or as Professor David said yesterday, neurological uh, disorders. Uh, actually, in this study uh, from the British Medical Journal in 2010, uh, two-thirds of doctors hallucinated their pager going off. So I think these were mainly junior doctors who were uh, on call a lot, and their pager was going off all the time, being told, 25 jobs to do on the ward uh, in the next five minutes. And so it's so frequent that they, you come to expect that it's going to happen and you make the perception. Nowadays, maybe it might be, you might think your phone has vibrated or given a message alert signal if you get a lot of messages. So you're so used to expecting it, you start to really perceive it. You might also have noticed your name being called if you're in a busy shop, shopping market or something. Um, and uh, so you, things that you expect a lot, you, you start to experience. It's not pathology, it's normal. Okay, um, who can see what's on the screen? Anybody see, there's a person and an animal. Okay, just look at that for a minute. Can you see the person and the animal now? So you've all, you're, now you have a prior expectation, and so your perception is now altered. You're using your prior expectation in, to, to, in your perception. This one, there's a human here. There he is. And there he is again. So do you see that now, or did I show it too quick? So you only need to see it for a second. So you can do this in an experiment. And my colleague Paul Fletcher did a few years ago with Christoph Teufel and colleagues. Which was some of my patients, so I wasn't involved in, 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 in this particular study. Um, and they had a look, and they showed these um, pictures like this, and then showed the, uh, the real one, and then you show this again, but all mixed up. It's not as easy as that. You see lots and lots all jumbled up, so uh, you don't see it immediately afterwards. And then see how much do you improve the second time round uh, after you've seen the clue. And showed it to people with very mild psychotic symptoms, or patients at risk of psychosis because they had uh, mild psychotic symptoms, but that need treatment, but not severe, that you'd say is a psychotic illness, prodromal symptoms. Now, this is how people do before you give them the clue, and this is how they do afterwards. So everybody does better once you give the clues, but uh, the patients actually improved more uh, than the controls. So that's quite unusual, isn't it? Usually we, we see patients not doing so well, but in this test, the patients improved more than the controls, so they were using the prior information more, which is helpful in the test. And another way of saying this is that the patients are weighting uh, the prior information heavily, uh, more strongly than the controls when you're making a dis decision. And patients with more hallucination showed it more strongly, although it's quite a small sample, so that's, uh, I would say that is preliminary. So that was an interesting uh, sort of evidence, maybe, that there's something going on in psychosis about these expectations. Uh, and another study that came out a few years ago from Al Powers at Yale um, looked at something similar, the effect of expectations. So they had some volunteers uh, in an interesting design. They had people who had hallucinations and a psychotic illness, 
that they call psychosis plus hallucination plus. And then they had some people with psychotic illness who didn't have hallucinations, just had delusions. Uh, and then they have some people who are healthy but have a lot of hallucinations. So they don't have any illness, but they have many frequent hall hallucinations, but they're not troubling to them or distressing or um, incapacitating. And then some people who don't have hallucinations or delusions. And then they trained these people. They kept showing them a flashing checkerboard, flashing on and off. Uh, and whenever they saw this flashing checkerboard, there was a noise that was played, a tone. And they did this so much that people started to expect the tone whenever they saw the flashing checkerboard. And, if, and sometimes they experience the tone even when there's no tone. If you do it enough training, then you start to experience the tone even when there isn't one, because you're expecting it so much. Uh, <coughs> and they found that the patients with psychosis and hallucinations were most likely to say, oh yes, I heard a tone, even when there was no tone. Uh, and then the next most likely were the people who have hallucinations but aren't ill. Uh, and the people with psychosis but no hallucinations didn't show this effect at all. So they were sort of, or very little. So some people are more susceptible to this sort of expectation effect. Uh, and then they did this in the brain scanner. And of course, when you hear something, it activates your auditory cortex. Uh, but if you zoom into the auditory cortex and you look at the times when there was no tone, but people said, oh, yes, I heard a tone then that activates the auditory cortex as well. So it's probably because the auditory cortex was activated, and then it's activated, and you think, oh, yes, I heard a tone. But it's just been conditioned to, to be activated. So people more prone to hear voices, more susceptible to induced auditory hallucinations, and they did some fancy computational modeling, uh, and that suggested that in um, people who hear voices, your prior expectations are being given more weight than the sensory data of whether the tone is really there or not. And another way of, sometimes this is referred to if you hear somebody saying, oh, voice hearers, they've got strong priors. That is what is sh a shorthand for this. They're uh, putting a lot of emphasis and weight, uh, or weight on the prior information and expectation. Okay, so Rick Adams and Carl Friston and colleagues from UCL in London proposed, so ha, proposed a model for how do patients end up with strong priors? You know, where do they come from, these strong priors? Out of nowhere? Well, they said, actually, what might happen first is the first problem might be low sensory priors. You have different kind of priors, priors about, uh, from sensory, informa sensory information, priors about thoughts, cognitive, so they thought that maybe you start off with low sensory priors or weighting sensory information too low, and then the brain, that's not good for your perception, so the brain has to do something to try and compensate, and they thought maybe you have to kind of override and compensate for this with a, a more high-level sort of cognitive expectation which, which somehow will help you to adapt. So they proposed that and we wanted to test it. So now we're going to show a video of an experiment, that, a framework that can help test it. So let's show the video, please, with, with some sound, hopefully. possible or is it too difficult to play the sound? Okay, it doesn't matter. It's all right. We, we'll, we can move on. Determination. Okay, I'll talk to it. So uh, while, while we're, to, I'll, talk, I'll talk to the, uh, about, so we have an experiment where uh, if you keep the sound the same, depending upon the, the movement of the lips, it alters your perception. 
So you might think that only deaf people uh, can read lips, but in fact, all of us have this uh, and by looking at the, the lips of the speaker, it alters the sensation that we hear. And so this is the McGurk effect, and some of you may know it if you've studied psychology, and it's a very powerful uh, effect, and, um, but it actually does depend on what language you were uh, uh, brought up in a a as a speaker. And um, so I think if you, uh, it won't work if your first language was Chinese or Japanese, but many European languages, you have this, uh, have this effect. So we did a study where um, we uh, vary the strength, how, uh, you can have the sounds ba and da, and depending upon the lips of the uh, image, you perceive the sound as more ba or more da. And then we um, can use a computer to sort of make the sound harder to distinguish. So it's the sound is really right in the middle of the two. And then by altering the shape of the lips, we, let, let's, can we just go back to the presentation? Uh, um, <laughs> but it, you have to have the, it won't work unless it's completely synchronized. So <laughs> it's okay, don't worry, it's fine. We'll just go back to the presentation. Maybe we can show it at the end. We could show it at the end and you could experience it in the break. Um, so, sorry? Yeah, you could just watch it on YouTube. So um, uh, we make the, we have the sound that's halfway in between. This is the waveform of what a bar sound is and what a dar sound is. And you can mix the two together to make it very difficult to distinguish. And the more difficult you make it, then, uh, then the more important the, the, the shape of the lips is. And then the other way you can alter what you hear is just by putting a massive uh, capital letters on the, si on the screen telling the participants what they're hearing. And you can uh, trick them sometimes by, if you tell people they're gonna hear da and then you play them ba, then uh, they still sometimes hear the one that you're trying to trick them into saying. So you can use this in, in, in the experiment. And then by doing so, and asking people which one they hear, you can work out, oh, to what extent are people using the information in the lips to help uh, them make the decision? And you can also work out to what extent are people using the information on the screen with the capital letters uh, to help them make the decision. So because the sight of the lips reaches the brain before the sound, that information gets there first, and we can call that sensory prior. Coming in through the eyes, looking at the shape of the lips. That's the sensory prior. And we're gonna call this a cognitive prior because reading is something higher level than just seeing a shape on the lips and you have to interpret the sound. We call that a cognitive prior. So we've got cognitive priors, We've got sensory priors, and we can see that in this experiment, first episode psychosis patients are using their sensory priors more strongly than the uh, controls, HSC healthy control subjects, and the arms, the patients with mild psychosis. So in this one, the at-risk mental state patients that with very early psychosis have the low sensory priors, which is what Rick Adams thought would happen. Uh, and then once you get to first episode psychosis, they have stronger priors for sensory strength, and then also in the cognitive strength, not much difference between the healthy controls and the at-risk mental state, but the first episode psychosis were using the written information more, so they had the stronger cognitive price. So there's a little bit of evidence for Rick Adams' idea that you start off with the perceptual information being too weak in psychosis. How does the brain compensate for that? You start to use this cognitive, high-level, more interpretive priors more, and 
We didn't do a longitudinal study, but by having the very early stage at-risk mental state uh, that's like an early stage, and then the, over time develop the first episode psychosis. So we approximate a longitudinal study. So there's some evidence for what Rick Adams said. So now we're going to go through to prediction error and learning. This is all very much in the moment, isn't it? But how do we learn over time? How do we update our understanding of the world and develop ideas and ex uh, uh, through experience? It's been suggested that dysfunctional learning could lead to forming abnormal associations between unconnected things, maybe irrelevant stimuli acquiring inappropriate significance, some people call that aberrant salience, and this could lead to abnormal expectations, or priors that we were talking about, which then themselves shape perception. So modern theories of learning center on this idea I've mentioned, prediction error or surprise. Surprise is the mismatch between what you're expecting and what you get. We can ignore predictable things. We don't need to learn from them. Everything's as we expected. So you don't need to pay much attention, unsurprising. If you're a Simpsons fan, you may remember when Homer Simpson makes a wonderful invention. He invents the everything is okay alarm. The everything okay is okay alarm gives a very loud blast. Every three seconds, if everything is okay. He thinks it's a wonderful invention. Of course, it's a disaster. We don't want an alarm to tell us that everything is okay. We want an alarm when you need to pay attention and you have to evacuate the building. And that's what your brain does. It has an alarm for surprise and prediction error. If everything's okay, it just keeps quiet. Okay, so we can formalize this. We can even put a bit of maths in. We can say when you're expecting something new, a value or any other expectation, uh, we update it in terms of what you thought it was before, and then you update it proportional to the amount of surprise or prediction error, and the proportion uh, is determined by alpha here, the so-called learning rate. If you're learning very quickly, alpha is high, and then this term is, is high, and you get more of an update. If you're a slow learner, then alpha can be low. So you can vary that according to the situation. And this very simple equation uh, is quite useful in explaining the behavior of rats whilst learning associations, uh, humans whilst learning causal associations. This equation can explain the behavior of dopamine neurons whilst monkeys are learning, and it can explain the behavior of the MRI signal whilst humans are learning about rewards and other associations. So it seems to be a kind of law of learning that we can observe in many different experimental contexts. I'm getting a surprise signal here because I think I might have run out of, have I, no? Could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so then we um, can do some brain imaging experiments, and when you give people surprises, and healthy volunteers, and patients with psychosis a very long time ago, and then you can see to what extent uh, the brain encodes this surprise signal, and in this area, it was it, which is in the midbrain, where the dopamine neurons are, uh, we found quite substantial differences in brain activations in patients and controls, but also across other brain regions as well. And then we replicated that um, a few years ago as well. So we could show that brain activation during surprise is different in patients and controls. Uh, and okay, that's all very well. So, but I'm gonna do another stage now, which is what about uncertainty? How do we learn when certain conditions are very uncertain? When there's uncertainty in the environment, we should take that into account uh, in terms of how well we learn. And you can formalize this by saying that the degree to which you update your beliefs according to a surprise should be scaled by some metric of the uncertainty in the environment. And you could call this precision. So precision is the inverse of variance. Statisticians know, know this very well. Um, so the more precise the environment, the more confident you can be in your update, the
the more varied and uncertain the environment, the more it's difficult to know if something new is just, oh, in this environment, everything is chaotic, or maybe there's some real signal here and things really have changed that we need to learn about. And it's been suggested that this might be also a particular problem in psychosis. So not only just updating into because of surprise, but also taking into account the uncertainty of the environment could be important as well. And this uncertainty or precision might be important in the development of psychosis. So this was Carl Friston's idea that psychosis is associated with a fail, and Chris Frith also, uh, a failure to take into account the precision when updating the brain's model and understanding of the world. So they thought that maybe this could be this precision weighting of the surprise or prediction error signal could go wrong in psychosis. And we can test this in the experiments as well, where we look at prediction error according to various degrees of precision. So this is the sort of test. So I have all these grand ideas, and then I show you incredibly simple, boring computer tests that we use to, uh, to test them. So this is what we do. We get participants to play a game, and we just say, look, there's, you need to guess the hidden number, which is a certain amount of money. You've got to guess what it is. And you might say, oh, I'm going to guess it's 23 pounds, and the computer tells you, oh, look, actually, it was 44. So you can work out that you know, it wasn't too bad, but it wasn't great either, and this is how much I was incorrect by. So that's your prediction error. We know what the person was expecting, we know what they got, the difference here is the prediction error. Uh, that's a bit different for some of the experiments that we did before, we had to estimate what the prediction error was and do some fancy computational modeling and then try and link that to the brain signal. But in this one, you know what the prediction error is, so you can then see, well, are there brain regions that are more, are more active when that prediction error is, is higher? So we have the guess, the weight, the answer, the prediction error, but we also show a cue, and the cue is telling the participants how uncertain this environment is gonna be. And the cue, this means a very big uncertainty, and this means things are very precise, not much uncertainty. Uh, mathematically, uh, you can say the Q is according to the standard deviation of the, um, the sample from which we, we draw the answers. But this one is precise, this one is imprecise, and this one is in the middle. So the story that you tell participants when they do this is said, well, we're playing a game where rewards are being drawn from a pot. The pot, there's an average value of the rewards in the pot, but there's also a spread of values. The spread can be wide or the spread can be narrow. And your job in doing the experiment is to make a guess as to what the upcoming rewards are gonna be. Watch the actual reward, update your guess the next time, and we tell people that they win. Uh, they win the rewards, or a, a percentage of the rewards, but they only win if they get it right. So you uh, have to be accurate in order to, to get the prize. And we studied this initially in about 60 healthy volunteers, and they took a placebo, an antipsychotic medicine, sulpride, or a dopamine agonist, uh, bromocryptine, and we looked at a surprise signal, which uh, is... For those of you interested in the technicalities, we can call an unsigned prediction error signal, which is thought to actually be in the cortex. This is where it is in monkeys. Uh, and this is where it is in humans, indeed, in the cortex. So in the superior frontal cortex, this is the surprise uh, signal. And also in the midline, where Tony David was talking about uh, yesterday. And we can see under the placebo condition first, this is when the uh, precision is high. So you, this is, w w what is the brain activation for surprise in the precise condition? The brain is very active. When the precision is low, when the spread, spread is big, the brain is not so active for the exact same amount of prediction error. So this is showing that your brain is doing a good job. 
when the spread is very big, you don't know so well, is this really uh, telling me something about the environment or is the environment just so chaotic I need to ignore and filter out all the noise? But when you have a precise environment, yeah, I need to pay attention to it. And so under placebo, uh, this happens very well. The cell pride doesn't really help very much in this situation, so this is when you're healthy, if you give people sulpiride, it's not very good for their uh, learning signals. If you give them a dopamine agonist, it actually seems to be quite helpful. Uh, and uh, the degree of precision, the shape of the slope is altered according to, to the drug in these brain regions. So the precision, the uh, prediction error is important for learning. It's encoded in the brain in the frontal cortex, this particular prediction error signal. It's weighted by the precision strong when the environment, environment is precise. It's weak when the environment is very variable. And it's something to do with dopamine. That's the point of that experiment with sulpiride and bromocryptine. Dopamine, you give a dopamine medicine and this can alter the signal. So something is going on with dopamine there. So what about in psychosis? We did an experiment with about 50 patients, some of whom had first episode psychosis, some in this at-risk mental state, mild psychotic symptoms, young patients, some controls. Uh, and we do the same experiment, and let's see how people learn. So if we have a look in the green, healthy controls learn the quickest. They learn quickly over time, and then, oh, they just sort of tend to plateau after about halfway through the experiment, they've done all the learning. At-risk mental states, pretty similar, not quite as good as controls, but they're learning quite rapidly with this curved. So this is sort of, this is good because when you, when you don't really know what's going on, you learn rapidly, and then later on, once you've kind of got the situation, you are not really learning anymore. So you learn fast at the beginning and then tail off. Uh, whereas the patients, it's a bit more linear. Uh, they do learn and they get there in the end, which is good news, uh, but they're not as quick. What about the degree of precision? If we look at controls, this really should say error, sorry. So the controls make um, less errors when the precision is high, and so there's quite a gap, and so they basically are performing much better in the precise condition. At-risk mental state, yep, performing better in the precise condition. And the first episode, psychosis, not really using the level of precision uh, to help them learn. We did some fancy computational modeling, and we, that suggested that controls are using the degree of precision weighting and also adapting their learning rate to the situation and the first episode psychosis are not using precision weighting and they're not adapting their learning weight. They do learn, but they do it in a more simple way. Which is fine, but it may be not so advantageous sometimes. Quite reliable brain activation in this cortical region with 80 subjects in the psychosis study. And then this is a previous study of 30 healthy controls, uh, the dopamine drug study. So. The sort of, it, this test reliably activates these brain, brain regions. Oops, now I pressed too hard. Okay, what about in the patients then? What was the brain activation like in the patients? So again, so here in the patients we have a very, uh, also the controls, precision weighting, Lots of prediction error activation when the environment is precise, not so much when it's uh, imprecise. Same with the at-risk mental states. Patients with psychosis are not showing this precision weighting. And the degree of precision weighting was related to the degree of schizotypal symptoms in healthy controls, and it was related to the degree of psychotic symptoms in the patients. So, we found that evidence of abnormalities in the way that you make decisions, I mean, very simple decisions in these little psychological tests, but it's a way of trying to test it in the lab. 
uh, abnormalities in the way decisions are made and associations and beliefs are formed in psychosis. I mean, they're very simple beliefs in these tests. You could argue, do these, are these the same kind of beliefs as in paranoia? But they are beliefs and perceptions. Uh, we found some evidence of cortical dysfunction in representing the degree of precision of the environment. We've got some evidence of the role of dopamine, although, of course, there could be other chemicals involved as well. Uh, so, I have given you an overview of the brain as a predictive engine, some evidence that predictive processing is different in people with psychosis. Uh, we've covered some theory of how psychotic symptom pathogenesis uh, can be understood, some practical examples of how it can be studied. I'll leave you to decide how convinced you are, whether these experiments in the lab are telling us anything about the real experience of patients in the community. Uh, some human preclinical experiments, which might point the way to how you could test drugs to see whether they are giving you the right pattern of brain activation, and maybe this could help you know whether they're going to be effective or not. Uh, um, and so I'm going to just say thank you very much to all the people who contributed to this work, and I'm very happy to take any questions if we have time. <laughs> Actually, why people warm up. I have a question, Graham. I was wondering, and I was thinking more about the role of the different layers of the cortex, how the role of prediction error changes over the lifespan, and if there have been longitudinal studies looking at that, also in relation to how we know dopamine level change over the lifetime. Yeah, so I didn't actually, let's see if we can, can we go back to the very, uh, the beginning? Could we shortcut back to the beginning? Okay, uh, thank you. Right, let's get to our picture. Right, so I didn't mention, thank you very much, Marta. I should have said this, actually. So I talked about these different cortical layers, and at the end I talked about dopamine. But what's dopamine got to do with this? So it's thought that, I mean, the, all this is happening to do with GABA and glutamate. It's not happening because of dopamine. As you know, you know GABA and glutamate are much more common in the, in the brain. Uh, we don't have any dopamine neurons in the cortex. The dopamine neurons are in the midbrain, although they project to the cortex, but we have the GABA and glutamate neurons in the cortex. So what we think happens is that the dopamine neurons are projecting from uh, the brainstem, and they are inputting here, and they are maybe tuning and helping to weight these expectation and sensory signals. So the interaction here and the effect of dopamine, thank you for pointing out, I should have done, is that the dopamine is um, helping to tune how much these uh, um, GABA and glutamate signals are that are passing the sensory uh, and uh, expectation information. So what this suggests this sort of model suggests that you don't need a dopaminergic abnormality to have psychotic, to, for, to have, say, illusory experiences. And we know that not all drugs that induce hallucinatory or psychotic experience are, are dopaminergic because we know that PCP uh, or LSD can induce hallucinations, but you know, they're not do dopaminergic. So we know. So I think dopamine is thought to be having its role uh, by impacting upon these signals across the cortex. But that is very difficult to, to measure that. But you could do, for example, this experiment that we talked about with the brain imaging, and then you could do that with a dopaminergic drug or any other drug and then you could see to what extent uh, the, the, the brain signals were modulated. Or, of course, you could do an animal experiment. Uh, and Katerina Schmack at UCL uh, is the person doing the most on this. And she gets mice 
to hallucinate in the same way that we talked about you can induce hallucinations by training people to uh, expect uh, a cue. So she does that with her mice. And then, of course, with mice, you can record from the, 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 the neurons themselves and, 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 and manipulate more easily. So uh, that would be one way to look at the chemistry. Graham's fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I, 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 I thought, thought, thought that Marta was asking also about uh, the issue of development mm. and, and, and prediction error. So I don't, want, I don't know whether you, you, you wanted to comment on it. Otherwise, I wanted to say a few things. But I think you should, you should, you should go. You explain it much more uh, aptly uh, than I'm well, ever able to. Well, thank you for reminding me that I actually yeah, only answered one bit of Marta's <laughs> question. Um, I think the development question is very interesting, isn't it? Because of when we know what the typical epidemiology of psychosis. But I do know there have been some studies of the McGurk effect over time, but I cannot remember. Uh, but so I think there is a developmental story with the McGurk effect, which you may be about to remind us of. Um, but um, it's only been fairly recently that people have started to look at some of these ideas. So I don't know how much has been done, but please tell us. No, I think you're right. I don't think that, I'm not aware of, of, of studies of the McGurk effect, but what, I, I, what is interesting is that adolescents seem to have to learn more from negative prediction errors. Um, 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 they, that there is probably higher reward sensitivity during adolescence as an inverted U-shaped curve um, and interestingly, we found some evidence that um, the differences between depressed people and controls uh, in terms of activation in the ventral striatum during reward anticipation in, 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 uh, between depressed and, yeah, depression and controls is higher during adolescence. So there seem to be some differences during that developmental period, but I don't know of, um, uh, of experiments other than the ones I mentioned in Tobias Hauser's ones that have looked into that. So that might be something very, very interesting to do given the increase in risk during that period of time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Definitely be, yeah, really good to do those sorts of studies through the, through the sort of the at-risk state. But I mean, of course, I've given, yeah, a psychosis story, but this idea of the brain, I mean, Carl, if you listen to Carl Friston, he will tell you it explains all aspects of human, uh, human nature and, and beyond. So all mental disorder plus all other. Uh, human experience plus plus. So uh, it's a very flexible framework. Hi, uh, Eric from Hong Kong. So, Graham, thank you for the very nice summary of uh, this area of work. Um, I meant to ask about social interaction. Okay, so in our uh, social um, transaction with other people, there is some inherent unpredictability in those interactions because, you know, game theory and so on, people are trying to be unpredictable when they are competitive and so on. So there is a, in real life, you know, that, that limit to predictability, particularly in social situations. And it may be that, you know, in psychosis that is more relevant in predicting how other people react. And uh, so I wonder to what extent the paradigm that you designed could be adapted to a more social interactional uh, paradigm. That's yeah, very interesting. Um, and I think that is true that we have tended to study these rather simple learning experiments. So we've tended to do ones that are the same ones that you can do in monkeys or rodents. And that's helpful for translation. But of course, it misses something of the human experience. Um, and, um, but people have made an attempt to bring in some social aspect, as you suggest, Eric. Um, so uh, what you can have when you do one of these learning tests, um, let's see. Yeah. Any one of these sort of ones where you're learning something, there's some conditioning, you're expecting something, uh, like this one, or the one where that we I said right at the end, you can introduce a confederate, uh, and uh, so actually we'll go we'll go right. Can we go? Oh yeah. So let's say we go to this one. You might make your guess. 
And then other, some people have designed experiments where, okay, now you, a little confederate, a, 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 a collaborator, appears on the screen and then tells you what their guess is. And then you have to say, well, do I, am I going to stick with my guess or do I trust uh, the, the help from my friend? There's a TV game show that was popular in Britain, I think it's been in other countries as well, where you have the answers and then you say what you think the answer is and then the TV host said, would you like to phone a friend to, to help you give you the answer? And so then, then the question, or would you like to ask the audience? And then the, 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 the candidate in the game has to decide, am I going to trust my friend? Am I going to trust the audience? How much am I going to update my expectations in the light of social information? And so, yeah, indeed, that has been adapted. We haven't personally done it. I think there has been, Chris Frith did a small study, um, uh, I've forgotten, I'm afraid, the name of the first author, but in patients. So, yeah, I think that is very interesting, and that is a way of, it adds complexity to the experiment, makes it harder to do, but I think it does capture something that, of course, is very important. So, I hope that, yeah, people will do some more studies with, with, with those paradigms as well, and that could give us some insight into that. Uh, I wanted to ask, I was thinking about theory of mind and um, I think that uh, people with psychosis have more trouble to recognize anger in other people. So do you think uh, that it has to do something with uh, growing up and learning in chaotic uh, environment and uh, all that you uh, were talking today? Um, so I think one way of fitting, um, if you think of the... Um, so we, with the experiment with the sound, we had a, a fairly ambiguous sound that people were using their prior expectations to help interpret. And indeed, one can do that with social information such as a facial expression for emotion. And there, yeah, you might take your prior expectation. So if you're the sort of person that you've had many adverse experiences and people are usually uh, angry or critical of you, then that may well shape your expectation uh, that uh, facial expressions tend to be angry or critical. Uh, and then when you perceive a neutral face, you may well be more prone to perceiving it as angry or, or critical. And so I think, yeah, that is indeed a way one can fit this expectation and learning over time and uh, into uh, theories about what might be mood or paranoia, yeah. So Greg, can you, you talked about bromocryptine, but can you explain how, or can this help you to explain why taking lots of amphetamines would make you go psychotic? So I didn't show our amphetamine data, which is very old now, but um, we did do an experiment with am amphetamine. And although bromocryptine wasn't a very good model of what was happening with first episode psychosis, because bromocryptine helped the brain signal, uh, amphetamine in another experiment impaired the brain signal and made the brain signals more like, look like what they were in the prediction error signals, look more like they are in psychosis and the expect, actually the expectation signal. So yeah, we haven't done this experiment with amphetamine, but with another uh, prediction error experiment, the amphetamine just sort of flooded the system, I guess the idea would be, and then there's just, uh, you're no longer precisely updating uh, matters. <clears throat> so I think it may depend exactly on the amount of dopaminergic sort of boost that you're getting, much more with amphetamine than you get with, with bromocryptine. At least we were giving quite high doses of, of amphetamine. As the highest that we could legally uh, gi give, give to people intravenously, we gave it. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I think the point that you made on one of the slides that perception is a result of the interplay between expectation and sensory input is something we, we don't appreciate enough as clinicians and we often use sensory input and perception almost interchangeably. 
And it seems like that point can help us understand lots of phenomena and lots of other conditions. Like, for example, take something like emotional unstable personality disorder. Someone has a fear of abandonment, so that would be the expectation. And then they zone in on sensory input that might confirm that. And I wonder if there's any work around this prediction, these prediction models in other conditions like depression or personality disorder or anything like that. Yeah, so I think that these modern, I mean, some of these theories are, in a way, some of this the work on illusions and so back goes back a very long time. Um, but the, it's been the last sort of 10 or 20 years that everything's been brought together, I suppose, in this predictive engine theory of the brain. Um, but actually, a lot of the ideas are already there in cognitive therapy about how um, uh, past experience shapes how, how one views the world and so forth. So I think once you see the new framework, then it can absorb lots of previously sort of unrelated information. Things like uh, mismatch negativity. Probably everyone who's gone to a psychosis conference has heard people talking about mismatch negativity and EEG signals. And then that can be incorporated into this predictive coding framework. Yeah, things to do with cognitive therapy can be. So lots of different ideas. It's very flexible, which is what some people like. Other people criticize it, say it's sort of too flexible. It can incorporate everything in unfalsifiable. So um, I think it, 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 it but it, it, it can be a very useful way of thinking about some of the pathologies that we see. There is a surprise for you. I don't know if it was predictable. But... Ba, 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 Have ba, a look at this. Ba, what do you ba. hear? Ba, 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 ba. But look what ba, happens ba, when we change the picture. Ba. Ba, 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 ba. And yet, ba, the sound ba, hasn't changed. In ba, every clip, ba, you are only ba, ever hearing ba, ba with a B. Ba, ba, ba. It's an illusion ba, known as the McGurk ba, effect. Ba, Take another ba, look. Ba. Concentrate first ba, on the right of the screen. Ba, ba, now to the left ba, of the screen. Ba, ba, the illusion occurs ba, because what you are seeing clashes ba, with what ba, you are hearing. Ba. In the illusion, um, what we see overrides what we hear. So um, the mouth movements we see as we look at a face can actually influence what we believe we're hearing. If we close our eyes, we actually hear the sound as it is. If we open our eyes, we actually see how the mouth movements can influence what we're hearing. Ba, ba, ba. It's a bizarre ba, effect. Ba, Remember, the only ba, sound you're hearing is ba, ba with a B. Ba, 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 ba. What's remarkable about this illusion is even knowing how it's done doesn't seem to make a difference. The effect works no matter how much you know about the effect. I've been studying the McGurk effect for 25 years now, and I've been the face in the stimuli. I've seen stimuli thousands and thousands of times, but the effect still works on me. I can't help it. Ba, 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 ba. The McGurk experiment shows us that even when our senses are working normally, we can still make mistakes in interpreting their signals. Because, so you ask about, because it didn't work for me, and of course English is not my first language. Oh, okay, yeah. So I think it, it depends on the, the sounds that you're exposed to when, when you're growing up, and it becomes very hardwired into your brain, but then maybe you can also hardwire to really focus on the sounds if you're a musician. So... Thank you very much. Thank you, and this is a good time to thank...